uh, February 7th, 2021. And um, we'll, we'll just have this as an open discussion. Um, uh, go ahead. Oh, you're uh, muted, Gary. Will we start that again, or do you want to just pick up somewhere here? Do, or, uh, oh, yeah, no, uh, yeah, just pick up from, from where you are. We were, we were having a discussion on, um, you know, the virus. And, uh, yeah, just go, go for it again. Um, <clears throat> what we were saying was that uh, in Australia, there's a conservative politician. His name is Craig Kelly, and he's recently been making... Uh, rather vocal statements about the use of ivermectin and hydrochloroquine for treating the early stages of the virus infection. And he's been universally howled down by everybody in parliament and, and in the media um, uh, as some kind of a nutter with a, uh, you know, an alternative agenda. Um, and... Um, uh, this went on for a few days in the media until eventually a uh, high-profile uh, professor uh, at one of the universities, I think it was, uh, you know, biomedical and pharmaceutical uh, pharmaceutical aspects that he was qualified in, um, he came out independently and made a statement in support of this politician, uh, basically saying that there is a proven track record for, at least for ivermectin, uh, for use in tr the early stages of the virus. Um, and yet, uh, he, 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 even this fellow was basically, you know, shoved under the carpet. Nobody wanted to hear this. It, it was clearly a case of it didn't matter whether this made sense or whether it was worthwhile. Nobody w was, was going to bother even investigating it because they all seemed absorbed in their agenda just to, just to call this guy a nutter. Uh, and basically just saying, well, the vaccine is 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 uh, the way to go and everything else is going to get ignored. Um, and I think I mentioned the uh, what's called the Therapeutic Goods Association, which is in Australia is like, what's the um, name of the organisation in America, the Food and Drug Administration? I think it's yeah, kind yeah. of like a, it, it's kind of a parallel to the, to the Food and Drug Administration administration it's supposed to be a body that's got representation from uh conventional medicine and any anybody else who's got a concern with health um uh, health and well-being but in, in, in that's only the theory in practice it's stacked up to the eyeballs with pharmaceutical um lackeys you know uh and it was very interesting that they came out and said um, that they weren't in support of, uh, of of the use of ivermectin, uh, and that there was they, they and they didn't think there was any credible research, uh, and yet um, uh, I think Hughes put up a video about that. That South African lady, or was it in Harare somewhere? That lady, that, that lady, the video you put up, and other people have put things up, and you know the the basis of it is that there's a uh, quite a good body of research for that drug actually and it's pretty easy to, to find it if you if you want to read about it um but basically the point i was getting to was this sort of um uh the, the way um, rational discussion is just locked out and the, the, the dominant agenda has just got to go ahead whether the dominant agenda is the best one or not we don't care we're sort of committed to this vaccine pathway and nothing else and, and that's the way it's going to be so um I think that just about encapsulates what we were uh, doing before the recording started at any rate. <clears throat> Isn't it extraordinary how everything has aligned to suppress freedom of speech and censorship is just waves of censorship have just come in. It's, it's, it's gone from free speech to uh, what I remember in South Africa where everything was controlled. Um, it's just just happened almost with the snap of the fingers. It's incredible how it's unfolded, and um, and and how it's coordinated. <laughs> you know, what I mean, it's like uh, you know, weren't weren't there supposed to be no conspiracies or anything? And now you know we've got to use 
you can't even use the word vaccine or something. You've got to use Greek letters and stuff just to, so thing, things aren't auto-removed. It's like being in China. It's unbelievable um, how quickly was, it's... You know. Yeah, I was also thinking about the... Uh, from a slightly different perspective, which is the way the, the media was enjoying having a feeding frenzy demolishing this guy. Um, and uh, and I, I, I wonder, too, whether there's what lies behind the tendency to want to scapegoat people is this kind of anger and it's a way of venting it. And and so, you know, it, it, I often wonder whether the people who are trashing someone like that really want to trash that person or whether they've just found a way to vent all their frustrations and angers, you know, whether it's a kind of a psychological um outlet for them they're just going to lash out at whatever's there that they can have a go at because you know when you look at the kind of society we live in and maybe this will bring us back towards the chimp discussion we're very restricted in the way we can express a strong emotion um you know and the society is very repressive you, you've got and you, you 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 know and then when something comes along that you think you can take a, a, a swipe at um even though it's unreasonable, a lot of people are going to jump at that opportunity, you know, to just sort of express themselves to, to because not just even under normal circumstances, but even even more so with the, the virus when people are both literally and psychologically more confined um, uh, than, than normal. You, you know, it's building up this... Pressure, you know. Yeah, it's. Uh, did you ever see the Crucible about the Salem witch trials? It's, yeah, I often yeah. feel like I'm in the Crucible or something the like crucible. that. It's it's, yeah. um, it's dreadful how quickly people uh, just trash principle, um, especially principle of freedom of, of expression, um, just because you know it's on the it's their side. So. You know what? If if they win the election, then it can't be rigged. <laughs> if you, you know, whatever you say, if it's if they're against Trump, then yeah, anything's a conspiracy theory or witch hunt. Then you know, just like burn them, bastards, <laughs> ban them, cancel them, and so like so like. Well, I mean, I don't like Alex Jones and I don't like Trump and stuff, but I, you know, it's a, it's Payne's thing where it says like, I, I you know I don't like what the guy says, but I would. Um, I would uh, stake my life to allow him to say it. And it's like, everybody is like, no, we just don't care about um, who who the person is or what they, it's just, are they saying what I'm saying? If not, then just blow them away. <laughs> just They don't have rights, just you know, kill them. Just, yeah, uh, but the thing is they're creating, they're creating a, another crucible by, by shutting down on things, they're, they're They've created another pressure cooker for all the people who are, who are sort of silenced. And I mean, I think you and a lot of other people were saying this about the Trump situation, that the more you shut it down, the more ultimately you're going to end up paying for it. Um, you know, so you go, you just, you're lurching from one bad situation. You can't, you, the, the cure it's a little bit like the civilization in general is the cure for it isn't more of it. You know, it's got to be something quite different. Yeah. It's, I'm kind of just upset that the left thinks that there's no price for this. They think that basically it's kind of like their right to silence people and cancel people and suppress them. And they think that there's no reaction. There's no price to it. And basically it, it comes for free. If, if you don't like somebody, you've, you've got to, or what something somebody says or what hurts your feelings, you've got an absolute right to shut that down with no recourse or consequence. And saying that, well, no, the whole Trump phenomena was a backlash against identity politics and all this, you know, kind of, you know, you it, you can't just ignore that connection. And people seem to. And uh, that's um I don't know why nobody seems to be calling that out, but I don't see anybody saying, you know, like uh, Trump, yeah, a backlash is what you get. You, you, there's a price to pay. I don't see anybody saying there's a price to pay for identity politics. Um, yeah, it's like we're caught in this perpetual 
um, action, uh, uh, what, re uh, revolution and counter, yeah, counter revolution. Yeah. yeah, well, we can't, like, yeah. it's like a pendulum. It, it's, you've got to, it's always going to an extreme. Uh, then there's a reaction to that extreme and it's going back to the other extreme and uh, there's no um, modulation, there's no... Uh, um, sorry, I kind of lost it there, but I, I mean, the thing is, you know, you've got to look at a, a civilization that's swinging from, ex, from, from revolution to counter-revolution all the time. It's, it's going to be doomed anyway. How can it possibly... Um, do anything constructive. Uh, well, I think they all did that. Uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, um, in one of her last interviews before she passed away, is uh, she said, you know, it doesn't matter about the Supreme Court going Republican. And she said, basically, it's a pendulum and it just swings back and forth. I think this is really on topic here because what I contend is that we have to change course. And that sw pendulum swinging back and forth is homeostatic. It just basically it keeps on um, keeps everything on the same path, so that we we we're stuck in a rut where this pendulum just goes back and forth and back and forth forever. Um, whereas we need to change course, and it's very difficult now to do anything other than swing the pendulum. So it's you know you need to find paradigm breaking. Uh, kind of strategies at the at this point, but there's not. There's everybody wants to shift uh, the paradigm towards the left or the right, um, and there are very few people that want to actually break it. But I think that's what we we need to do, and I think that's really what the the thing is. How do you get the caged chimp um, to rebel against its its incarceration? Uh, is is really how do you get people out of a rat, how do you get them out of homeostasis when, when we're heading, you know, towards destruction? Yeah. Did you see, did anybody see the Roger Hallam thing with um, Kevin not and Black Band News? Not yet, I that, no. Yeah, I thought no, I was no. very disturbed by that. I must admit it. I guess it was, Roger was, uh, was late at night or something and he spoke more honestly or something. Maybe he was a little bit fried or something, but I, I never heard, heard him talking so honestly about the big picture um, and it was deeply disturbing. Did Sophie, did you find it disturbing? I haven't watched it yet. I'm going to watch it this oh. evening. I, I'm going, I, there's so much to, to process in the things you, you post because I, I try to, to watch them all or to read them. So I have to, I have to do it a little bit at a time because it's, it's very, <laughs> it's, it's a lot, but I will definitely tonight because, because after that next week, I'm going to I'm going to go on a, a sort of digital uh, detox. Um, I'm going to just cut off for a week, uh, except phone and email. But other than that, I'm just gonna I'm going to catch up with all the stuff that you have posted. Yeah. Thankfully, because you know, I mean, there's so many useful things. Hugh, I'm very thankful for all the research and the time you spend at that. I don't know how you do it, honestly. Uh, it's I don't know. quite an exciting time. It's been, I mean, there have been so many um, things that might be portentous events, you know, happening. Yeah, yeah. It really you seems know, like things are coming to a head soon. Yeah, we, had, uh, we, had the the we had the Sorry. same story. Yeah, same. I, I, it, it's, it's, uh, uh, there was a guy, a virologist in last spring, who started the story about the chloroquine, the hydroxychloroquine, and the same and same thing with the media, same hammering. It's just that he came a bit earlier, so for a while he was, you know, he was able to come on the main things. The vaccine wasn't there yet, but it, they did the same witch hunt and the same kind of scapegoating. The well, mechanism. I think, yeah, unfortunately, I think probably um, this is where Trump muddied the water a lot because he was just pulling things out of his hat without any kind of knowledge about what he was talking about. And I think that's just <clears throat> unfortunately set everybody up <clears throat> to be highly reactive against any kind of uh, alternative suggestions. Um, because I think I think Trump actually did talk about hydrochloroquine, didn't he, and some other things? I can't remember now. Yeah, um, he did. 
<laughs> yeah, but you know, it's very easy to say everything Trump said was shit. And I mean, you know, there's this another black and white polarizing thing. Um, you know, to, to just uh, every every time Trump opened his mouth, everybody went ah. Nobody listened to actually what he said. And I don't know at what percentage of what he said is bullshit. I have no, I'm not qualified to say that. But it's the same thing with him. I'm, I'm I have no sympathy for Trump. If I was an American, I don't think I would have ever voted for a guy like that. But it's the same thing. He scapegoated too. If you think about it, yeah, I mean, but. I, you know? I mean, I can see why the 74 million people voted for him because um, people are, you know, it's, it's gone too far basically in one direction and people want, <laughs> want it to be taken back. So, I mean, you know, it's, yeah, I can see, I can see why. But uh, yeah, Trump is just a complete psychopath out for himself and he just grabs things off the shelf that he thinks might even, even psychopaths sometimes can say true things do you know what i mean it's just yeah, that's right. it's like a broken clock is uh, you know right, right to at least twice a day but in this case it's like oh, <laughs> this clock is never right <laughs> yeah it's unfortunate because um i think that there are some things that are not right in point of fact but they as you know i said last time in point of principle they are correct so that kind of gets swept aside in the fact that you know he what he's saying literally is not true but in in some ways there is some truth to it and so the baby's being thrown out with the bathwater and i think it might be maliciously done that way um they, they almost relish the fact that that he says something wrong because it hides the truth um you know the, the the literal truth comes out uh, correctly, but the bigger truth is lost in the minute. Yeah, it's, it, the, the, I think more and more it's becoming like Macbeth, you know, with Banquo's quote that I put up there was, um, you know, they betray us. They win us with honest trifles to betray us in deepest consequence. And there's the so much of that, yeah. you know, so much of that. There's people yeah. have literally, you know, fact check, tiny item true or false and you're saying like and then they say oh this is not true and it's like well okay not that specific thing but you're writing off the whole thing you know basically if you if you did a whole you know manifesto and you've got one truth and oh that's debunked <laughs> it's like hang on that's just one tiny little item out of the manifesto what about the rest and so basically you shoot down these whole zeppelins um, just just with pellet guns for one single fact that fact checks uh, that doesn't fact check true. So it's it's pernicious because it allows people to to um, get away with a huge lying assumption based on a small truth or a small untruth. It's or like um, a small untruth. So some of the talks of that Chris Hedges gave where he was talking about the the uh, the right in in America and this sort of uh, um, neo-Nazi thing, the, the Proud Boys, all this whole concatenation that was following Trump around. And, uh, you know, it, it's just what you say. You're getting this reaction against it. But he... But, he was looking beneath it and saying, hey, you know, this is the result of 40 years of erosion of workers' rights and, and lowering of standard of living, which has built up an enormous amount of pressure. And, and uh, that is, you know, one of the substantial things behind this, this kind of uh, extreme position that these people are taking. So, you know, by, by sort of dismissing them, you're missing the underlying message which I guess is, you know, basically what you're just saying in another way. Yeah, I think the long march is has been going on for for ages, and then at some stage, you know, there's a backlash and it gets knocked back, um, you know, decades. But anyway, yeah, but there, there was there was something we were supposed to be talking about this this time. What, the what was you, wanted, the you were going to talk about the silver and the chimps? I don't know how you want to. Do I wanted to lead into the chimp thing a little bit? Do you want to put that on hold yeah. for a while, or no, no? What what did you want to say about the chimp? Thing? Th I'll shut up after this because I've already said too much. Um, but um, uh, I was thinking about, you know, your question was, well, how do you free a caged chimp? 
And, um, you know, of course, the example, one of the classic examples was the one you'd given about the, the uh, when they opened the gates of the concentration camp and everybody just stayed there. They didn't, didn't walk out. They could have done anything they wanted to and they were all just sort of huddled inside still. And um, that sort of led me to thinking about Viktor Frankl and some of the others who have been through that experience. Uh, and it, it seems from my limited reading that one of the consistent things that people like Frankel have said is that the ones who survived um, were the ones who had something going on for them inside that the others didn't have. And that they were, they were, you know, maybe they had a higher understanding of things or they had even just down to having a profound religious faith maybe. You know, they had something going for them that, that was enough to keep them alive and, and keep them surviving psychologically, so to speak. And then I was, just wanted to connect that back to the topic of the chimp because, um, you know, I could see the discussion was going to go into, well, <clears throat> how do we convince people to give up their addiction to the society we live in and bravely you know, sort of go where no civilised person has ever gone before. Um, but it seemed to me that it was very much the same question and the same mechanism as that of spiritual awakening. Like if you haven't let go of your egoic identification, you're not going to be able to let go of your addiction to society either. The two things are basically one and the same, really. You know, so I don't know if you want to pick up there just from that point. That was basically where I wanted to get to. Yeah, I, I never quite agreed with Viktor Frankl about the religious aspect or something uh, like that. What my interpretation of it was, there was always something that people could depersonalize depers the situation. So it was a transpersonal. Um, if it was a transpersonal experience, the trauma wasn't quite so bad. So, for example, like when when I was doing basic training in the, in the military, then it always amazed me that people took it so damn seriously, <laughs> because um, you know the whole the whole thing in basic training was just to break down your ego and then you know build you up again as a unit. That's what all basic training is for. It's a kind of a hazing ritual um, to kind of knock the shit out of you and uh, de-egotize you so that you can you know, form a, a bigger squad that um, has a bigger ego. But um, it, in that process, it always amazed me how personally people would take it so that it, it would break them. Um, they, they would do techniques like they would get two um, officers or uh, basically training corporals and they were instructors and they, they would they would get a guy who was who, who they thought had attitude or was cocky or something like that. They would they would haul him out, and then um, they would give him conflicting commands and put him in a double bind. And if if you know anything about the psychology of schizophrenia or something, a good way to make people schizophrenic is to put them in a double bind. Um, so they would do that by simply just saying, you know, oh, get down on your knee, <laughs> so get down and give me fifty press ups <laughs> now. And the guy would get down. And the other guy would say, uh, you know, the, the other instructor would be standing on his other shoulder. And he would, I think they did this in Platoon. I think if you remember oh, Full Metal Jacket or some, one of those movies, I think they did exactly the same. So as soon as I saw it, I kind of laughed because it's obviously done in all, in all military situations throughout the world. But then, you know, the other instructor says, like, what are you doing down on the ground? Did I tell you to get down? Stand up. And then the guy says, you know, says, stand attention. And then the guy stands up and then the other guy says, what are you doing? You haven't done 50 press-ups, you did three, get down. And, you know, basically the guy, would, they would turn into a gibbering wreck because they get in these conflicting. And I, you know, when it happened to me, I just, you know, I knew what the game was and I thought, like, everybody knows what the game is. They're just trying to fuck you up and you just play along. I it just never, I could never see why they people took uh, took it so damn personally and, and why it was impersonal. So for ex another example is they would, you know, run you around in an impossible task. You could say run, you know, 1.4 kilometers and then everybody, the whole unit had to make it and you couldn't make it in the time that they specified. 
And so then they'd say, okay, well, you have to run again, but you're getting tighter and tighter. So they make it, make you run it again and again. You, you can't make the time, but it gets worse and worse. Everybody would get so distraught. They thought, you know, like, like oh, we're going to run till the end of time now because we'll never get um, get over the finish line in the time. And it was like, I, and I said to the guys, you know, like, look, we know that basically PT lasts from like, you know, 12 till 4 o'clock. At 4 o'clock, we have to go on to do the next thing. <laughs> it's, it's like they'll fuck us around until 4 o'clock. Don't get so involved in the fact that we're not making the time or not. You know as well as I do that this shit is going to last from 12 o'clock till 4 o'clock, and then they're going to go on to some next shit. And nobody seemed to get that. They would get so into the fact that they couldn't make the time. And so they'd have, they say, like, look, if you make the time, you just go on to the next exercise and they'll fuck you around in some new way. But it's going to go till 4 o'clock. So just play along. You don't have to make the time. Just you know, miss it by five minutes. <laughs> What's the guy going to do? You'll make you run again. Or, well, run, jog slowly and <laughs> string it out. Till four. And nobody thought of it like that way. I never I never could quite get why they didn't think. Like, no, I, I you know, think everybody knew you were in basic training and they knew what the protocol is and they knew what they were doing. So, yeah, but I think that you can get it. You could get it. But you yeah. see, what That's Gary was, was Gary made mm. me think of when he said, is the chimp. Most chimps don't know there is a cage. So it's how to get them out. If you don't know there is a cage, why would you get out of it? You know? I mean, yeah, well, the, the first step is to, yeah, it's, it's a bit like the missionaries. They say before you can save somebody, um, uh, then you have to convince them that they lost. And so all missionaries would try and convince you that you needed God. <laughs> and then they would, or you needed something, and then they'd, give you Jesus. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, but everybody, all the chimps do know that this is not right. They, they do know that there's this continual kind of cloud over their heads. And there's, there's this kind of headwind always in people's life, that life is this quiet struggle all the time. And, uh, you know, it's, it's like Jordan Peterson always saying, he's saying like, you know, said that life is suffering. You know, that's what the religious people have always said. And that's what they do in religions is they try and convince you that life is suffering because, you know, they don't want to tell you captivity is suffering uh, because it means you've got an alternative. They tell you life is suffering. So your only alternative is death. <laughs> and so, uh, but that's not true. Uh, indigenous people don't suffer. We, we were taught in school how indigenous people suffered and it's all a complete lie. When anthropologists will tell you that you know they had a, indigenous people have a very easy life, and then they tell you, well, no, but you know they all died at thirty. I say, no, that's a complete myth. They had higher child mortality, but they didn't die at thirty. Um, they lived as if you if you passed about the age of seven, you would live as long as anybody else does uh, today. But you know the only thing that modern medicine has given us is is really. Um, epidemiology or, or rather um, uh, vaccinations and things like that. That's, that's the only thing that's really extended our lifespan and, and uh, basically increased or decreased child, child mortality. But we, we kept on saying all of this stuff to say, you know, the way you suffer now is, is natural, as if, as if all animals are, are born to suffer. And it's like, nah. If you look in the natural world, animals are not suffering. I'm, I go walking, just walking around this afternoon, looking at the seagulls and stuff around here, all the natural things around here. And it's, it's like they're all having a gas. The, <laughs> the wind is blowing and they're, they're having fun. All the animals seem to be having fun, except the people. <laughs> and then they tell you, well, people are not supposed to have fun. It's like, why? Why? But in the cartoon, in the cartoon that you posted, that initiated our conversation a couple of weeks ago, this chimp was caged since birth, and he was not aware of of the fact that he was in a cage because he was only made aware of it maybe when he was brought back to the wild, and and that's where the knot of the of the conversation should be because you can't you can't free a chimp that doesn't know he's caged. I don't think so. It's the cage that you have to concentrate on. Is the mechanic introduced the concept of slavery? So, so one of the reasons they they were very big in the south and and actually in in 
in Africa too, in fact, even in South Africa where I grew up, they were very big on not teaching slaves to read. And uh, the reason was that the John Brown's rebellion, slave rebellion in the in the South, um, was uh, they they attributed it to allowing him to read. And what they said was, <clears throat> because he learned to read and write, he learned what a slave was. And that led him to, to do a slave revolt. So they're saying, like, if they don't, if slaves can't read and write, they don't know what a slave is. It's kind of like Dave Chappelle in that other thing about, uh, you know, those hookers. If they, if they don't really understand how the pimping game works, um, they don't really, many of them think of themselves as hookers. That, that word, they don't associate with themselves. <clears throat> so... It's true with most liberals, although they suffer and they suffer under, <coughs> under a system of labor extraction. They don't think of it that way because the labor extraction is very sophisticated. It's done through the financial system and it's very indirect. But when, when their life is shitty, they, they take it personally and they never associate them, themselves with slavery. So even though they, they're educated, they can read about slavery. Uh, in fact, I'll go further and say this, that if you study slavery and, and um, uh, just say it's uh, in college or something like that, they, they tell a different story to what slavery is. And um, we, we have this kind of cartoonish version of what slavery is. Even if you study it, um, you know, and, in anthropology or, or social science or something, if you study, there's, there's, there's an agreed narrative that is very remote from, from us. It's all, almost a conspiracy so that people cannot recognize their condition as slavery. So slaves are made uh, to be something remote and other, and that's, and I, I, and I, I really, my hackles get up with, with a kind of racist or ethnic version of slavery, especially uh, anything that says, you know, uh, associates slaves with black people. That really gets my back up because slavery, we're all slaves, right? They, and so to, to, to ex exceptionalize it and say, well, I mean, um, black people have suffered a, a lot more under slavery uh, um, than, than white people, but it's all done by degree. So the what what it allows the th the special casing or or the exceptionalism of black slavery is really pretending that that we're not slaves. It's something unique to black people and very remote. And then, and then saying like it's nothing like that. I think that's an important disservice that higher education gives us, especially in liberal democracies. It try it fills people with white guilt. And, you, and as as if to say, you know, we've profited out of black slavery. And I say, no, we're under the same system. We're just on a different level of the hierarchy. But um, basically, the privilege feeds up, uh, up, upwards. So basically, the exploitation is is downward. And um, so, yeah, the the beneficiary of the pig fat that's been burnt in the fire below us, uh, basically, all. Uh, graduates upwards, uh, the, the wealth trickles trickles up. So yeah, sure, people on the higher social strata are beneficiaries, but they're no less uh, slaves than anybody else in the hierarchy. And so I think that that's, that, that's one of the disservices of identity politics is, is this thing saying, well, no, it's a black issue and say, no, I'm a slave too. <laughs> you, you don't get to, yeah, you know, I've, reparations and stuff like that. It's like, I want reparations. I, I came to America as as an African-American. I'm an African-American. I came under an indentured system. I, I, I was brought under under, um, under the H-1B visa system. And they strung that out deliberately. They, they made no bones about it, that, that while I was working there, I was underpaid at least 50%. And basically, they strung out the H-1B process until I got a green card for four years. It should have taken two years, but they deliberately strung it along, and they did that because the, the company I worked for paid for the lawyers very cunningly, and the lawyers knew which side the bread was buttered, so they strung the process out. Um, and, and at one stage, 
one of the directors even admitted that they're stringing out the process because it's not in the company's interest to get it done quickly because it's going to cost them money. So I was brought in on that should say, I, I, yeah, I mean, nobody's going to give me, rep uh, you know, reparations for, for all the, the time I was... Um, you know, pay, underpaid and deliberately underpaid. So, so basically, that's indentured servitude, and so you can do that under this capitalist system. But everybody is the same. It's basically uh, undocumented workers are, are exactly the same. The reason why they have undocumented workers is, and they they have the system they have is because as undocumented wor workers, you can pay them less, and so that's that, it's it's kind of this. Um, this double standard where we pretend that there's this, you know, American dream and there's basically um, uh, the path, you know, the dream ticket path and stuff like that. And and it's it's like it's all organized uh, slavery to, to underpay pe people for, for their work. But the system couldn't, couldn't function without um, illegal immigration in America. And, and nobody says that. No, nobody comes out and says... You know, what, one of the things that Trump's wall was doing was destroying the the farms in in the San Joaquin Valley and stuff because they couldn't get get workers for pittance anymore. And then there's been, people say, "Well, we'll be we'll, we'll be ruined because crops are going you know going rotten in the fields because we can't afford to pick them." And they're well, well, you have to pay, pay them the the price. Well, the, you know, pay workers a price that will be commensurate with that wage in an open market. And of course, you know, Americans would only pick fruit and tomatoes and stuff for serious amounts of money. It's really hard work. So if you paid people what, what the job is worth, then a burger would cost, you know, $50 at McDonald's. And then basically people health would, would go up because basically an apple would be as bad as cheap as it is now. But a burger would be much more expensive, so people would be healthier. So the whole system is rotten. The whole thing about you know, once you start on an exploitative system like this, this hierarchy, it, it's it's a fetid, seething mass of, of mess. Um, but it's very hard to tell people that because they reasonably comfortable. They've made the devil's bargain, and they've they've kind of settled. And so particularly liberals are the worst counter-revolutionaries because they've kind of sold out for small change, you know. Uh, yeah. I would like to make a comment um, when you were saying, Hugh, about um, uh, not taking things personally. Uh, I think uh, because uh, kind of like weaving in the threads of what we've been talking in this past weeks, um, because of competition, um, it's almost like we blame ourselves, um, you know, um, if we fail, we, we, there's a veil and we don't see that, like you said, the system is rotten. And so, you know, like as a white collar worker, I'm subject to all these articles and essays about how can you become more productive? How can you manage your time better? How can you compete better? How can you up your game? So we are slaves to that because of the competition and we can't see that we're being exploited and being driven to some level of um, unachievable um, efficiency. So, and then, and then sometimes I ask myself, well, what's wrong with me? Why can't I, <laughs> why can't I produce more? Whereas, you know, it's like, we're, we're just kind of slaves to, and then we don't have time to, to develop fully because we're just, um, trying to always compete and achieve in our own little niche of our work. That's, that's the comment I see about weaving in threads of how competition and blaming ourselves personally and um, slavery. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. Uh, and it was deliberate, right? That they, they got people to have individual responsibility so that they, uh, it's kind of like a battered wife syndrome so that they make all of us feel unworthy and then basically we 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 kind of none of us are kind of quite making the grade and the fact that we we are not making the grade is nothing to do with the system or the scam they're pulling on us it's nothing to do with the injustice of the system it's our personal failing so it that that's how the church and state works together this the church in particular has this idea of original and individual sin 
so then you know basically the catholic church as well has this you know idea of confession and you you know, it's it's exactly the, the, it's a cult um it's a standard cult technique so it's used in things like um the scientologists will take confessions they do they call it um auditing and they will take um confessions from you which are then recorded and used semi as blackmail against you but the catholic church does the same the, the uh, a priest in your local church would take confession from all these people and of course he would he would get to know all the dirty secrets of the whole neighborhood and essentially be, be able to blackmail and i know in greece the guys the guys are able to molest kids because nobody can take them down because they know all the dirty secrets of everybody and they can all cross check it and they've, they've had it all through confession so it's a dirty dirty system and the catholic church knows it the greek orthodox church knows exactly that's the power of the priest but the priests in in, in greece they're rich they're, they're rich buggers and the reason why they're rich is they know everything that's going on and they have tabs on everybody they're kind of a bit uh, like um you know the fbi and um and uh, what's his name not mccarthy um who started there? Uh, Hoover, yeah. He's basically got a. These priests have a file on everybody because they've heard it all through confession, and so it's it's like the Stasi and the Catholic Church knows that. But the the benefit of that for the state is that it makes people sinners and then has um, you know has them perpetually in a state of of guilt. So it's very interesting the word guilt. Um, guilt uh, in Germany, the guilt is the same as same word as sin and debt so basically what it is is a debt system the whole basis of this is to try and make you convince you that you have a debt and the idea is that that your our primate brains have a very keen instinct of uh, debt accounting so you know basically they're very clued into who um who groomed who and for exactly how long and and the, they keep meticulous accounts, primates, in, the, um, in their brains of exactly who owes who what. Um, and so they, they use that system to pretend that we, we owe a debt, that we, we just don't own. So every time you, you know, if you pick up a dollar, that's in, in essence an, an IOU, it's an instrument of debt. But every, you know, they, everything we have from mortgages to car loans to... Um, just this individual set, sense of having to work hard to justify our existence is, is working on this primate uh, module in our brains that is primarily um, based, based on debt. And, and you can get people collectively to side with the state because they can, they can easily say, oh, this person was, didn't pay their debts. They, they're a deadbeat bad, dad. They um, they basically shirkers or they you know they underperforming based on what the team does or they they've got a million ways of saying that this person owes a debt to society and it's like you don't own anything to society society owes you but then you know you get Robert Kennedy or or jfk coming along and saying you know ask not what your country can do for you ask what you can do for your country what he's saying there is like you know hang hang you know hang a bit of guilt on you know what you can do for america <laughs> it's like america's sucking the life out of you and it's not returning anything but uh, that's that's the way the system functions and so it's it's very important part of a rebellion that people break that contract and so one of the reasons why i try and get people to do a bit of uh, monkey wrenching therapy is because that's a clear divide uh, it's a clear breach of the this hobbesian contract with society so if you you know you're you're if you work for a corporation they 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 stealing your your labor they basically what they do is they pay you for your time and then keep your work product knowing full well that your work product's worth a hell of a lot more than your hourly wage has to be otherwise the company wouldn't be in profit so they're taking your product and stealing it. Um, basically, that's what the, the, what the capitalist system is all about. Now, we assume that we owe the company something, and we're very appreciative of the short-changing wage that we get. So it's, that's why Marx called it wage slavery. But the 
the thing is though that uh we're being taken for suckers we're basically you know being being used now to break that contract our perceived contract that we have a debt to the company or the country or something like that is a, a, is is to do an act of sabotage against it so you you sabotage the, the workplace and then basically that's a clear breach in your deep down in your monkey brain that is saying you know basically i'm doing an act of rebellion now monkey brain is very strong in terms of rebellion in terms of um in terms of deceit in terms of being machiavellian um and uh and also in terms of of just ridicule so uh, our monkey brain is very keen on respect and uh especially for a big alpha male but it's just as keen it loves um you know basically uh parody and for power figures to be brought down so so it it loves that kind of cutting of the daisies just as much so you can flip over what the monkey brain does by getting it to do an act of insurrection against the zoo so if you ca the monkey's caged in a zoo in a cage uh part of the zookeeper's trick or imagine it like a circus trainer the part of the circus trainer or pimp or whatever is to keep the animals and you know the performers in the circus to feel they have some kind of undue obligation that they just don't have to the to the ringleader in the circus um but if you if you do even a simple act against that uh the, the entity that you're supposed to have a debt to that that's a clear breach you know deep psychology of a clear um defection from that that obligation and and you are essentially free as soon as you do that you know when as soon as you do a, a small act not only do you feel um great it's it's the perfect cure for depression um but uh you feel empowered uh you get serotonin and uh you 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 also uh from then on out um on on a much more of a power trip of of getting revenge against <laughs> against uh um against an exploiter or or a master now the system if if even a small percentage of people do that um the system can't function if they do it in stealth in other words they do it in a wrecking thing so that the system can't find the people and do retribution now uh, then then uh, the system falls apart very quickly and you can see this because if it ever happens if it ever breaks out in the system the system goes on ape shit high alert because if the people surreptitiously working against the system uh whatever it is whether it's a ship at sea or a military pl platoon or corporation um they if people are defecting and working against uh the the bigger social group um that that can spread like wildfire so i do believe that that could be one of the big tipping points and i don't agree with uh, roger hallam that you know oh, you get you get a whole bunch of people to have uh, mass action and mass disobedience what i'm talking about is disobedience and i am talking about mass dis disobedience but not the way that roger hallam is talking about which which is kind of um a childish temper tantrum where you sit in the street you cause disruption and then you kind of reinforcing the master slave relationship by it's almost childish because you 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 treating the power brokers as if they are your your parents and you you're acting like a spoiled toddler going i'm going to sit in the road till you do what i say and that's not what i'm saying if the toddler does it in stealth so that they basically they don't know who who's doing the disobedience then then that is far more powerful that's basically what what that is the beginning of is the end of the of the whole system because if people oh yeah go ahead no i i agree 100% with what you're saying but to go to go deeper in in what we were talking about i i can understand that people who are aware of the system how it's functioning and can act in this way and stealth and sabotage is all okay but okay that we there we talking about people who are aware but what we were talking about earlier is the cage and most people would not do that out of guilt number 1 and number 2 why would they do it you see 
there's something missing to get more people to rebel and i'm not talking about the roger, roger allen way i'm talking about what you're talking about deep down people have to feel that they're slaves feel the cage and i mean i've been since my teens trying to to, to tell people around me you know hello but it just doesn't it just doesn't work i, I mean know. You can't tell people no. You you won't get anywhere if you t try and get people to feel the cage. They they have a vested interest in not seeing the cage because, for one thing, there's a sunk cost. So they've they've got um, uh, a bias, um, uh, basically a uh, not only a dependency bias but but a a loss aversion because if you tell them that they in a in, if they incarcerated and they are caged chimps, they have to admit that they've been fooled for their entire life. So it's much easier than basically taking that on board and saying, oh, you're right, I've been a complete schmuck for my entire life. It's much easier to just say, no, you're a threat and fuck off. <laughs> I'm not taking your crap. You, you giving me cognitive dissonance. You basically challenging my worldview. And you basically making me admit that I've been a stupid twat my whole life. So you won't get anywhere on that that way. The way to go is it's kind of like aversion therapy. So aversion therapy um, or um, the, the opposite where you I can't remember what the therapy is called, where you condition people uh, basically with agoraphobia. You go very slowly and you introduce people slowly. I can't. So there's aversion therapy and there's habituation therapy. I can't remember what the correct word is, but you slowly habituate people. Uh, like agrophobics, by tiny increments, get introduced um, into by, into uh, coping with their phobia. So it's the same kind of thing. And one of the first things to do is to is rather than try and convince people they're in a cage, is to go slowly and try and give them a taste for freedom. So, for example, anything to do with novelty will help them. Uh, with freedom. So the exercise I gave you of, of just r relaxing, <coughs> and we should go over that again um, uh, soon in one of these things, if you remind me, not now, but um, for other people that are, might be listening to these videos, is uh, is to introduce something like novelty. So, so here's an exercise, and I think maybe we should do this exercise during the week and come back next Sunday and just say what, what happened. But I would suggest that all of us um, go and have a look at the things that we do hab habitually. So when you put an animal in the zoo, they tend to pace up and down. They go psychotic and, part, you know, they pace up and down in the cage and they do these repetitive behaviors and humans do too. The commute back and forward to work is one of these repetitive behaviors that is um, like pacing up and down the cage. It's semi-psychotic, but people do it en masse. And so, so when you do that, you'll find that you do it in a, in a very automatic response. So you basically you very uh, fixed action. So it's like a fixed action potential. And you do the same thing in the same way. And it may, it's very tedious. It's very boring. And it's giving you a little bit of cortisol. It's basically uh, bringing your mood down, your energy down, and making you feel rather shitty inside. But, so what I'm talking about is the very, very specifics of these tiny repetitive behaviors. So, for example, if you used to commute to work, you'll notice that you have a ritual and uh, this routine where you go out of the door, um, you will notice that you always have your eyes in the same place as you go down the three steps in your porch, perhaps, or when you put the keys in, your, in the lock of your car. You always do it the same way with the same hand, looking at the same spot. And to introduce you to a bit of novelty, try and do something deliberately novel each time you do all these actions. So, for example, do, do apeshit stuff. Just when you put the key in the door, have a look over your right shoulder or do anything you don't normally do. When you go down the three steps, you're always looking down the three steps. Look up and to the left or something like that. See if you could do it with your eyes closed and just hearing. So introduce novelty 
into these repetitive action behaviors, which are very unnatural. No, no animal should be doing this shit. These, uh, you know, continual repetitive routines are just fucking, uh, they're just inhuman. But they've conditioned us to do them from early childhood. And uh, it's called socializing and it's part of schooling. But to de-socialize yourself, start doing un anything unusual that you never normally do. So if you sit in a cafeteria, go and sit with somebody you would never dream of sitting with. Go and sit on the other side of the cafeteria where you don't normally sit. Whatever you do, just to start uh, doing novel things and start to enjoy the novelty. Um, and what you'll find is that, well, I don't want to preempt your discoveries, but what you'll find is that you, you start uh, having a whole new world open up inside all this routine of, of behavior. Um, and, and that's, you know, that's the first step of sampling, a tiny, tiny taste of freedom. Um, that, you know, after, after a while doing, doing that exercise and the, this one I've just given you, and the relaxing exercise, uh, you can start to get uh, tastes of freedom. And uh, at some stage you'll notice that uh, you're on a different kind of trip to everybody else. Um, yeah, every, it's very important to, to say when people are talking or you're talking to somebody or you're talking to the boss or talking on the phone or doing something you do repetitively, is, is just uh, attend to something different attend to say whenever you talk to your boss you might notice that you're always attending to the their voice or you're always looking them in the eye or you're always looking at their necklace or their tie or their lapel or their hair and say do do something different just just turn away and look out the window or something just you'll you'll be amazed um if you consciously try and build up all these little bits of novelty. You can build uh, novelty in your day and you'll be surprised. But anyway, give it a go and see see what happens. But I think that's a better route to go, <laughs> is to give people little tastes of freedom. Um, and yeah, people, some people want novelty. Um, they crave novelty and they, they naturally feel caged. But for people that just feel down um, and don't really know why, it helps to to just give them uh, each one of those things. Actually, it gives you a little spike of energy, and so uh, the that spike of of energy is is worth a big loss to big farmer. Basically, they're making money out of um, Zoloft and all these SSRIs, um, serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Basically, they they're selling you your own serotonin. Basically, what what all those pharmaceutical companies are doing, they're selling you a plug to plug in your synapses. So the serotonin can't be reabsorbed. In other words, you've got more of it floating around. Um, so they don't, they don't give you more serotonin. They just stop you soaking it up. And that's what, what all these, all SSRIs, uh, I mean, all, all these psychotropic drugs for making happy pills, they all, they all serotonin reuptake inhibitors. So if you, if you do this exercise, you'll start to get serotonin naturally because you'll get more serotonin, not that you, you will get it less inhibited or you, the, you won't get it reabsorbed as quickly, but because you just have more because of the novelty. Serotonin is also a novelty, um, a novelty uh, hormone. And is where we're supposed to get it from is from the natural environment. It's, it really comes from food. So it's, it's really supposed to be this thing that gets us out of bed and gets hun hunt hunting because we're hungry. We go down to the river and we go, and go into the forest to find fruit and all of this stuff because, because we have a lack of serotonin and it drives us forward. And, to, and then as soon as we get a peach or something, we sink our teeth into it, get loads of serotonin out of the peach, literally. Um, so, so that's our reward mechanism. And so we, we can't, you know, really go to the store and get um, a peach in the same way. There's just not, not enough work involved in you know, work and reward. Um, but you can do it consciously, like I told you, um, and do it for free. Just all the, all the little actions that you do all day, just try and tweak them a little bit, do something novel. And then when you get used to that, you know, go bigger. 
and do more and more novel things. Um, yeah. Hugh, um, uh, just thinking about what you were saying, that you're in your routine, you know, but in order to do some of the things that you've suggested, um, aren't you having what amounts to a momentary awakening? You, you've got to have that remembrance. It's got to come from outside your ordinary um, habitual mindset. So for a moment, you've got to be kind of outside yourself to real to to think. Oh, I'll turn the other way, or I'll walk in the other direction, or sit in the other place. It, it, it's like just a, a, a brief awakening. Gary, uh, always give the game away. Yes, that's exactly what it is. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, but I wanted to. So, so sorry, going back to Victor Frankel, right? The ba basically, yeah, that's where the, I wanted to go. The way that you get aloof, you see, you see, yeah. part of the thing that I'm not telling you, I didn't explain in, in, until now. You forced me to, is that that you have to remember that Hugh told you to. Oh, sorry. Let me restart. Yeah, so the idea is that basically you, you have to feel aloof uh, just in remembering. So if you remember, hey, Hugh told me to do something different, that act of remembering automatically mm. uh, makes, makes it a transpersonal, yeah, transcendent yeah. experience because then you're yeah. standing above what you normally do. So whatever little action you were going to do habitually, suddenly you're not doing it habitually. Suddenly you're paying attention. Yeah. So it's, it's, so half the battle is remembering it. So if you can remember it, then you you getting to the Viktor Frankl stage without religion or any you know filled your head with rocks and stupid myths and stuff. You can do it consciously without that stuff, and that's where I think Viktor Frankl didn't know that that you can do by technique. You don't you don't what um, some people basically achieved by uh, some some kind of bigger oceanic um, spiritual feeling. It's very dangerous to do that stuff with spiritual feeling because you, you see a lot of those people in those camps that had that spiritual feeling taken away at a stroke when they got to the the, the gas chambers there's there's the there are reports of people that that said you know rabbis and things right at the door of the death chambers and stuff where they're saying like you know there is no god and the guys are just despairing so they used God all the way as a crutch. And it's a very crap crutch because God doesn't exist. And so, you know, it's a, it basically, it's not true. It's just a rabbit's foot. So it's no, so Victor Frankl wasn't doing the world a service, telling people that oh, they should be religious, then they can survive Auschwitz. It's like, no, in the Auschwitz we in, the plantation we in, they use religion to keep the plantation going. They, it's a slave cult. And a big part of the slave story is this Christian myth that you must sacrifice yourself for this pie in the sky. That's that's what Jesus was doing, was sacrificing himself for basically eternal life. It's like, you're not getting eternal life. You're fucking stone dead. As soon as you drop dead, you're dead. But they, they filled these slaves' heads in with this saying, your life's crap now. But you'll get your reward in heaven. It's like how many fucking bastards were submitted to slavery um, and did it voluntarily because they thought they were going to get 72 virgins in heaven. It's like, it's, yeah. just, it's obscene. It's obscene. A religion is just disgusting. So Viktor Frankl wasn't doing anybody any favors. No, I, 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 I've got to admit, I didn't go very far into Frankl, but um, uh, I think sometimes I've noticed that people uh don't have the language to express <clears throat> spirituality as distinct from religion <clears throat> and they tend to talk uh, um in religious terms when that isn't actually really what they mean um i, I don't know how, so how much extent that would apply to frankel or not i, I really don't um what are, i just want to go back for to where you were talking about military training a, a little while ago um because there seems to be a parallel there that you were the one in that that group of people who was able to to um have the transpersonal view of it 
Um, and it's, it's, it's got to be a parallel there with the concentration camp thing is is that a few of those people were able to um, detach themselves from the immediate situation and see it from a different perspective. Uh, um, you know, but they were very far and few between. So you, you marched into that situation. You had already ha had substantial stuff in your life before you even began military training. You, you were coming into that place with, with, you know, head and shoulders above all the other people who were there. In, in a way, you had this sort of unfair advantage. Um, uh, so, so I, I don't know if I'm leading anywhere there. Maybe we'll just bring it back a little bit. Well, no, so, so the unfair advantage I had was was that the school system I went to, the private school system, which was, like I mentioned, was based on the English feeder system for the empire. And it was an imperial schooling system. And then that, that you know, toughened you up for the army. That's what they're doing. So, so when, when, when you got to military training, the people that went through my school and that, we, we thought it was kind of like a cakewalk because we'd had so many years where we were very analytical and we knew exactly what what the school was trying to do and what the program was and we we were kind of veterans of you know s screwing the system and uh, yeah we 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 had a definite distance in our minds from the system and so we we were kind of amazed that uh, people took it so seriously because we just thought the system's the system one one of the yeah, things though you'd already yeah, go gone through you'd already gone through the uh the school of philosophy or whatever your other school is called, you know, if you're a guru and that. Yeah. It, it, yeah. You already had that under your belt as well by the time you got yeah. to the military. Yeah. I, I, that's more what I was thinking of, but, you know. There were some guys that I knew that they got through it with, uh, they, they had some Buddhist training. And so they got through it um, just because they could detach their, their minds from it. So the, that's, the, that was their way of getting out. So, yeah, it, but the idea of um, taking it personally, it's very funny how these systems work. They, the instructors could tell if, if they were getting to you or not. And so they, they left people like us alone because they could tell that if they started on us, it would turn against them because... If you, basically, if they can't crack your shell, it's a very bad lesson to all the other ones. It's it's better to pick on the weak ones, and then basically they they uh, can intimidate uh, everybody or everybody that doesn't know the trick. But if if they get somebody that really resists them, and then they can't break them, they could be in serious trouble. They could have the whole um, basically squad or barracks or flight or whatever the the unit is. The whole unit could take the lead from that one hard nut. And then that, that can really fuck up the system. So they, they have to really avoid uh, challenging somebody that they think uh, they can't actually break. So, so if they realize, you, you know, they give you a, a little testing run, and if they realize, uh, okay, this guy gets it, uh, they have to make you an officer because basically it, there's only if you work against the system or are able to work against the system, that is the end of the system. The only thing they can really do is, you know, make you an officer and make you responsible for the system. Um, but for the for the average Joe that 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 will uh, be intimidated by the system, um, they they will basically be on, on part of the lower ranks and they'll basically be the the instruments of the organization. So, but if, if you can stand aloof from it, they'll make you an officer because you, you can act. And so that's, that's one of the primary things they're trying to do. Yeah, yeah. So basically you're saying that if you arrive in the army setting or the workplace or whatever place of slavery that exists in our society, if you are not prepared, awakened or trained in a proper way, the dice are cast, more or less. 
And no. not even not even trained. Just if if you know what I mean, it's ten minutes explanation. If you if you just believe it, and <laughs> it's ten minutes explanation to say, oh, this is all a load of crap. And if if you if you under hear hear it and understand, it, that's all it takes. Yeah, it's but what I'm saying is, believe in this. You an except. I mean, you're talking about exceptions, like real friends. Let's say, for example, your group of people who your guy with Buddhist training you and a few who have been to these schools etc okay maybe you were toughened up and and uh maybe your eyes were opened young in formative years but the majority of 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 human beings who are cast into this life are formatted at a very young age to be unable to see the cage and to be able uh, to no, not no no you can break out of it like yeah that. But so it's why wasn't would you why you would you I'm doing the devil's advocate, but why would you, if you are not, if you haven't been um, educated or trained, why would no, you? No, it's not a long process. It's it's basically culturally speaking, instantly. So the 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 reason why the boys at this at my school weren't inculcated is because it was part of the culture. So so you could get any one of the other guys in the military. In the first day, if they were brought into our school, in the first day, they'd be like, you know, they would see something that somebody would break the rules and stuff egregiously, and they'd be horrified because they're sheep, and we'd give them complete anxiety attack to say, what the fuck did you just do? I said, yeah, I just laid a turd in the, in the you know, the teacher's drawer. And they go, like, what the fuck? Are you crazy? And he said, like, yeah, it's what he deserves. Basically, you tell him and I'll fuck you up. And then basically the, the person would be like, ah, you can't do that. But it would last for one day. Then eventually they'd see, oh, you can no. do that? They, then they basically in and it's gone like a snap. Just, yeah. just the fact that they see it, it's gone. It's it's, it's a kind of a spell. You see. I, I don't you know. know. I did the same as you in my school. It was pretty strict. And I never stopped disrupting and breaking and doing things like that not as far as a turd in a drawer but might be worse than that actually sometimes and i had lots of people around me who were looking at me being the the troublemaker and, and disrupting everything and questioning everything but i followed a lot of those people throughout their life and they became obedient little slaves of the system and even though by being exposed to my my misbehaviors and my uh, they they just no they just didn't didn't get it. Do you know what I mean? Okay, so, so the general categories, right? So the, the very first category are the sheep. And the sheep are under a spell. You can you can break it that spell instantaneously just by example, just, just with a snap of the fingers. And basically that spell is easily broken. It doesn't need long years of training or anything. Then then there are the rebels. The the mistake the rebels make is that they work against the system. And the system has uh, mechanisms designed into it, and basically it's uh, it grinds them down. So there's a saying like non carborundum. How does that saying go? It says basically don't let the buggers grind you down. It's it's uh, this bit of pig Latin we used to say uh, non carborundum nilus something or other. But I can't remember. But any anyway, it was, it was fake Latin for don't let the buggers grind you down. And, and so what the rebels do is they go beating against the system and the system grinds them down till, till they're obedient. Then there's the third kind, which is I'm trying to tell you to be. And that, that is the buggers who appear, who, who the devious ones of the lot, that appear to be pro the system, but are working to undermine it in secret. Those are the seriously dangerous ones. Because they, they never get ground down, they get promoted. So I, I always got promoted, <laughs> and they didn't know that I was working against the system. I know, me too. I, I always I always was first of my class, got all my things and uh, exams and everything. I was They couldn't kick me out because I, was, I had too many good results and schools and everything. But uh, but And, and I, I'm, I am who I am now. That's fine. But I'm talking about the people around me um, didn't seem to, to, to go th that way, even though we were doing stuff together. You see, they, they knew that I was operating as a, a complete stealth inside the, the, everything I was in, whether it's study or group or anything. But I, I, am, I am still surrounded with people I knew from a long, long, long time ago. And we're just on 
on two different planets when it comes to understanding the system. And, you know, so I don't people are going to make a terrible bargain, right? They, they sell out. So people are trying yeah. to take the easiest path. And at some stage, they say, look, it's just easier to just go to the Chestnut Tree Cafe and play ball. And that it's the Winston Smith's thing that they basically sell out. Now, that's fine in the normal course of events. But where we're at in a broader picture now is that in a global scale, we don't get to sell out. The system is going to take us right over the precipice. So, so there's no the easy option is not the easy option. The easy option is the fatal option. And I think more and more people will, will start to realize that. And then, then when people are ready, they say, okay, we're shorn of all these delusions. We know that these people are not going to stop the system, and the system is absolutely fatal for us on the planet. Then what do we do about it? And you think, well, that's easy. <laughs> you start a wrecking campaign and stuff. And basically, not for any result, but just because it's the right action. Basically, you, once you realize, okay, I get it. We're in Auschwitz. And what do you do? You say, man, there are a lot of things to do. Auschwitz really needs and functions with everybody doing their job. So everybody's got to be a little Eichmann. Everybody does their job. If the, those, uh, you know, those concentration camps couldn't have functioned if people systematically um, sabotage them on a continual basis. I'm talking 5%. You, you couldn't run those concentration camps if people were sabotaging them deliberately in stealth to, to the extent of 5%. But, but people don't. People try and align themselves with the easiest, uh, the easiest course. And the system presents you, they herd you into uh, and funnel you into the easiest course. So they stream you into the easiest course. And that's the course that basically maintains the system best. But if you, if you appear to be funneled into that and then basically don't you defect and work against it then they're in real trouble if even a very small number five percent or so one in twenty does it so so that's what i'm hoping is more and more people will start to realize that and then at least in our little neck of the woods we at least have a little net, network of people <laughs> doing right action maybe, maybe we'll show those videos in schools <laughs> yeah yeah i mean <laughs> it's quite good to have these videos up there and basically so, so, so they can, yeah, you know, they can, can come and find them. them and think, yeah. Oh, yeah. Have all these people yeah. been shot by, by, by the authoritarians? Because these, yeah. <laughs> these guys had some cool shit back in the day. Uh, yeah. Yeah. We should have these instead of being on YouTube, it should be on those young people platforms like TikTok or whatever. I don't know what they call. I don't know what they what they use. But I think what, what they they Hmm? They sound bites and they're such narrow clips. Yeah, so it's, it's, exactly, really, exactly. it's really for people when, when they start to get serious, then they can come and look at stuff. Yeah, it's it's true. Not, the attention yeah, span is the attention is span is too short. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but I, we should try I, in the future to make little short little things like that we can just probably propel on various platforms that the young people use, like little snippets of what we say. And a format for young people before they enter um, yeah. uh, in high school, you know? <laughs> yeah, they, they, they can be trailheads for, um, you know, into the arg, basically. Yeah. All those trailheads to lead them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. But any, anyway, I, I, was, I, I, I said I'd um, go on Black Bear, basically based on that. That um, the thing I did with um, uh, that Kevin did with, with Rosa Hallam, and then I posted my response on uh, some ad. So, yeah. so he read it and he said, you know, can you go on um, Black Bear now? So I'm going to oh. go right now. You're going to go. I'll, I'll watch it there then. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Okay. All right. Well, so, that was cool. Where are you going? Uh, Blackberry uh, on, News. On Blackberry News, Kevin's. He's going to have a live stream. Is that will that be recorded? Yeah, yeah it'll be on Kevin's oh. channel. Kevin. Just, okay. Yeah. Should be live on his channel now. I better. I better get yeah. done. Kevin, Kevin, which oh. Kevin? Kevin Sandbloom. Uh, Kevin. Kevin Sandbloom. 
Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Just just look for Black Bear News. So if you just search. Black Bear News. Yeah. Or or I can send you the link. Or yeah. I'll watch yeah. It. yeah. Well, it will have to happen before my digital detox. So hopefully tonight. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Right. Well, thanks everybody. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Hugh. Thanks, thanks everybody. Okay. It's thanks to everyone. Wait, wait. I have a question. Right. Will Black Bear News. B L A C K B E A R. Yeah. Black Bear. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah, it's quite, it should be easy yeah. to find. Yeah, or yeah. Just search for Kevin Sandbloom, you'll probably get something if you yeah. can't find it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Bye. 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 Bye